Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, uh, distinguished participants, welcome to our uh, panel discussion on the intriguing topic of redefining the concept of harm reduction. Today, today we have an honor of hosting one of the foremost experts on the field, Dr. Kostatinos Farsaninos. Uh, Daniela gave us a brief introduction. But in short, who is Dr. Farsalinos? He's a physician, as you mentioned me, cardiologist by training, but also a research associate at the University of Patras and University of West Attica, Attica in Greece. Greece. Uh, his field of expertise is public health, and if I may notice, very popular specialization and very popular field of expertise in the last couple of years. Uh, you have published approximately 100 studies and articles in international peer review of scientific journals. And besides being a renowned researcher, you're also a strong advocate of harm reduction, especially in tobacco harm reduction. Well, uh, how I imagined our discussion today, I would like to have an open conversation on everything. Uh, I will use this opportunity to delve deep into the concept of harm reduction and also to explore all the challenges, all the potential problems, or um, some would say even controversies, and the, uh, also the broader issue, issues of surrounding the decline of trust and science. Uh, without further ado, uh, let me ask you my first question is, um, can you explain the details, like in school, like to your university uh, uh, college students, what is harm reduction as a concept in public health and why it needs to be redefined? And yes, I'm immediately asking you, what's the definition and what is the redefinition of the term? So, uh, first, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> Uh, this is a subject which is very much within the context of this forum. Yeah. So we're talking about communication, we're talking about prevention, we're talking about controversy, as you mentioned. It's a highly controversial topic, and that creates a lot of communication challenges and a lot of trust issues between uh, the society, uh, citizens, and both the scientific community and the regulators. Um, harm reduction started as a concept and as a term with um, intravenous drug users yeah. and with the prevention of communicable disease among these users such as hepatitis and HIV. Uh, but in reality, and many people maybe, maybe don't think about harm reduction that they, uh, as a concept that they apply in our daily lives, it is part of all our daily activities. So I'm going to give you two characteristic examples of a harm reduction approach. Uh, the use of seat belts and helmets is a typical harm reduction approach because it doesn't make driving a car or a motorcycle absolutely safe. Yeah. It reduces the risk. And of course, we don't prevent people from taking their car and having a vacation with their family despite this being a risky behavior. We're always advising them to use their seat belts or if you use a motorcycle to use your helmet and reduce your risk of driving a car. But even on a more broader perspective, one of the typical cases of harm reduction science is medicine itself. Because as doctors, we cannot cure diseases besides some infections, but we treat them. So when someone has a heart attack, he will remain a cardiovascular patient for the rest of his life. Yeah. We cannot eliminate the disease. But we are trying to prevent complications. We are reducing the decline in the quality of life, the adverse effects of the of the uh, disease. We are doing all these things which are harm reduction, a harm reduction approach. Reduce the harm caused by the disease uh, and the consequence of the disease. And how are we doing that in medicine? We are using medications and medical interventions, all of which have potential side effects and complications. Uh, and why we're using them? Not because they're absolutely safe, but because the benefit by far outweighs the risk course, associated yeah. with this. So that's in reality the concept of harm reduction and specifically discussing about harm reduction for smoking, the so-called tobacco harm reduction, is uh, a philosophy and a strategy that will affect more than one billion smokers in the world because despite 60 years of knowledge about smoking and the adverse effects of smoking, we still have more than a billion smokers. But why we have a full understanding and probably here unanimous position. You mentioned, I don't know, clean needles for the drug other addicts. Similar problem is, I don't know, with condoms in communities with the problems with uh, uh, yes. HIV uh, epidemic. 
But uh, when it comes to more traditional industries, not only, not only the backer industry, but uh, in general traditional industries, or even modern technologies, with products, uh, we have a problem with products that could, use help, uh, could cause health problems in the long term. Uh, and if we discuss about that, that products, these products, in context of harm reduction, then it's a very controversi controversial. Well, I can explain it by using one word, yeah. nicotine. Okay. <laughs> the controversy is about nicotine. And the problem that we have also seen, and we have published a study on that, is that even among the scientific community, uh, among physicians, I'm talking about healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. there is a big misperception and confusion between nicotine effects and smoking effects. So the vast majority of um, uh, healthcare professionals, 80%, uh, in a study that we published in uh, 2016, in Greece, uh, said that nicotine is an important, very important, or extremely important contributor in smoking-related lung cancer, cancer yeah. in other organs, and cardiovascular disease. But in reality, nicotine does not cause cancer. It's not even classified as a carcinogen, and does not even have any significant effect in uh, smoking-related cardiovascular disease. So there has been uh, a demonization of nicotine, which happened for a single reason, because until very recently, until 10, 15 years ago, there was only one major source of nicotine intake for people, and that was tobacco cigarettes. So you understand, you can find studies in the 60s, the 70s, that have on their title effects of nicotine, and they were only looking at smoking effects, not nicotine yeah. effects. So this has created, you know, a strong basis of uh, predisposition, I would say, that nicotine and smoking are the same things, but they're not. And the concept of tobacco harm reduction is based on providing nicotine through a cleaner form, through a cleaner yeah. product, not through tobacco smoking, mainly by avoiding combustion, by avoiding the burning of organic material. You know, when a smoker takes a puff, the tip of the cigarette is heated at temperatures of more than 800 degrees Celsius. So you understand the amount yeah. of toxic chemicals that are produced from burning organic matter like tobacco. It doesn't matter if you burn tobacco or something else. All these toxins are produced and inhaled. Nicotine is one of them, but I will remind everyone, that I suppose there are many healthcare professionals among the audience, that nicotine has been approved for use in medications. And in <laughs> fact, by the US FDA and the UK MHRA, it has been approved, nicotine replacement therapies have been approved for long-term, even lifelong use for a smoker who is unable to quit without using uh, an alternative form of nicotine in terms of uh, nicotine replacement therapies. So there is strong evidence, even epidemiological evidence, that if you deliver nicotine in a clean form, I wouldn't say that it's absolutely safe because nothing is absolutely safe, but the effects are absolutely minimal and by far by far lower than smoking tobacco cigarettes. Yeah, we had a co I have one personal question. Hope it's okay. We yeah. had a coffee before, and I noticed that you are smoking some sort of ele uh, electronic cigarette. I'm not smoking it. Uh, okay. <laughs> have you ever been a traditional smoker, uh, cigarette addict, tobacco cigarette addict? Unfortunately, I have been a smoker in my life, uh, <laughs> and I have repeatedly succeeded to quit smoking in the past, which means that I have succeed, uh, repeatedly <laughs> relapsed. And that's a big problem. You know, the reason why we still have one billion smokers is first that it's extremely hard for people to quit, but it's even harder to maintain smoke-free in the long term. You know, the best smoking cessation medications have a success rate of 50, 60% during the first two months that you're taking the medication. But when you look at one year, more than 75% of uh, these people who managed to quit initially have relapsed back to smoking. So, and that's why we measure smoking cessation at one year. Uh, that means that overall the success rate of even the best approach that we have now is 20%. And let me tell you that I have repeatedly tried all smoking cessation medications. Gums. I mean, uh, gums, uh, bupropion <laughs> and varenicline. These are the two most successful to even today smoking cessation medications, oral medications. I have succeeded repeatedly, but I have relapsed repeatedly. Sorry, that, that's, a, that's a drug with some pills? Or yes, yeah. these are pills, yes. Uh, nicotine gums and nicotine replacement therapies are considered 
the worst in terms of um, success rate um, of the therapies. Uh, <laughs> so you understand that the smoking dependence is not only nicotine, otherwise nicotine replacement therapies would have been the, more, the most successful. But the problem is that not only that they are, of course, better than trying by yourself to quit, but not as successful as we wanted them to be, the second problem that is present globally is that smokers don't want to ask for advice by physicians, even in countries where they don't pay anything. For example, in the UK, yeah. all the medications and the smoking cessation services are fully subsidized by the state. But not many smokers want to go to smoking cessation services. When we ask them why you don't want to go to a service which is free for you, they reply that they don't consider smoking a disease, but a bad lifestyle choice and a bad lifestyle habit. So they consider that the approach to quitting smoking is changing their lifestyle and not treating some sort of a disease. Uh, I'm not going to argue whether this is the correct or the wrong yeah. approach, but I'm going to be realistic. That's what people think. And the reason we need harm reduction is not to substitute all other uh, approved methods, but to supplement this effort. So for those people who are, for those smokers who are unable or unwilling to quit with medications, with psychological support, with, uh, with the help of a smoking cessation service, uh, we should provide them some additional options. And that's a third line option is tobacco harm reduction. In the UK, however, I must say that the harm reduction products have been introduced into the smoking cessation services. So uh, smoking cessation centers actively endorse the use of electronic cigarettes. Uh, vape shops have opened inside hospital buildings in the UK. The hospitals. Inside the building of the hospital, you know, <laughs> not only the outer okay. perimetry, in the hospital, because they consider that when a smoker sees a vape shop inside uh, a building, they think that it's a motivation for them to give it a try. You know, now, one month ago, they introduced a program, which is paid by the government, of uh, the electronic cigarette users sending back their used products through Royal Mail for recycling and getting new products for free by the government in cooperation with the local uh, retail industry. Yeah. So um, the UK has a very, I mean, liberal and probably more uh, courageous approach to and the issue. And the UK and especially Sweden was mentioned even here today as a positive example or in fighting the, the, the uh, high rates of incidents that we have in Croatia, you similarly in, in, in Greece, Greece the yeah, same, yeah, almost yes. the same, yes. Uh, you know, and basically we are topping the, the, the EU. Uh, you know, on, on this, this, is, this is a very big topic. <laughs> uh, EU has a vision of becoming smoke-free by 2040. So that's in 17 years. Sweden has managed to do that today. Yeah. The, 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 the smoking rate in Sweden is 5%. But what is even more interesting, Sweden has not reduced nicotine intake at all. The only thing that changed in Sweden from the 80s to today is that they switched the source of nicotine intake from tobacco cigarettes to snooze. So today, uh, by looking at the Eurobarometer 2020 data, uh, Sweden has a smoking rate of 5% versus 26% for the European Union on average. But the nicotine use rate is the same. It's about 26%. But snus is another controversial topic. Probably it's a very controversial are, 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 topic. Yeah. Why? Because it's the only product with long-term human epidemiological evidence that it is of minimal harm. In many cases, for example, for cardiovascular disease and for many cancers, it's basically risk-free. What about throat, throat cancer? Uh, not at all. Oral cancer, not at all. Uh, there are all, only a few studies uh, having a slightly elevated risk for pancreatic cancer, which is also disputable. Uh, but it's banned in the EU, you know. <laughs> and the EU has a paradox of allowing legally the sales of the most lethal nicotine-containing product, which is the tobacco cigarette, and banning the sales of the, one of the least lethal nicotine-containing products, which is snus. You know, a, a review in the US about snooze suggested that if all smokers were snooze users, smoking-related cancers would have been reduced by 99.7%. And if the whole population of the US were snooze users, but there was not a single smoker, 
the, the cancer rates would have been reduced by 98% con compared to what they were having today with the, smoking, the, the current smoking rates at the time of the study. Okay. We, you mentioned for several times, snooze, smoke-free tobacco, nicotine products. We have also mentioned earlier, uh, and here and earlier today, Sweden, UK as a positive examples. But one of the main concerns is that there is no, n not enough research about, especially new, new tobacco products. Yes. Uh, what about, um, what about that? Uh, should we, should we wait for more years to pass to have more long-term evidence? Is that? This we is. We don't know. It's potentially hard. I or understand. Not, yeah. uh, what you refer to is the so-called precautionary principle. Yeah which is particularly problematic. There's a lot of literature about the precautionary principle when applying and uh, preparing legislative uh, frameworks. The thing is the, this, that the same argument was used 10 years ago when the product w where products were relatively new, four years old, let's say. The same argument is used today after 15 years of use, tens of millions of users globally, and not having any public health uh, emergency caused by these products. And uh, maybe I will explain to you later what happened. Well, I, I, I was suspecting that you were going to ask about a valley, probably, yes, in the US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in, uh, just before the pandemic, in uh, mid-2019, there, uh, there were cases of acute lung injury happening within a few, uh, one or two weeks of using some uh, products. At that time, they reported that electronic cigarettes were the culprit. That's why they called the disease e-cigarette or vaping-associated vaping lung injury. Uh, it was then, in January 2020, became obvious, and the CDC acknowledged that this disease was caused by illicit marijuana oils, which were adulterated with vitamin E acetate, and that was the reason why people got this condition. And that makes perfect sense, because why would we have no such case uh, for the previous 10 years with millions of users globally? And why are we suddenly having cases like this appearing in late 2019, only in one country in the world, and that is the, U the US? So unfortunately, the misnomer a valley remains because eventually it was proven that it had nothing to do with electronic cigarettes as we have in Europe or even in the US. But still the name creates that sort of confusion and that's another problem of communication and trust, you know, because now the Americans still today believe that the valley was caused by electronic cigarettes and not by uh, illicit marijuana oils. Yes, I, I, I will refer again to the physician, to the healthcare professionals uh, in the room. Uh, can anyone imagine that in order to develop uh, an antihypertensive uh, medication, we would need 20 years of epidemiological evidence in thousands of people before marketing the product? It can never happen. If we use that argument for any consumer or even pharmaceutical product, asking for long-term epidemiological evidence when someone is developing an antihypertensive medication or when someone is developing statins in the, a in the late 80s, we still wouldn't have statins in the market, you know, if we were asking for 30 years of studies. My, my father is taking statins for 30 years, but when he started taking statins, no one had took statins was taking statins for 30 years. We didn't know what's going to happen to someone who will take statins for 30 years. But the product was marketed. So uh, the unknown is something that always exists in science, but the decisions are based on current knowledge. And I think that after 15 years of knowledge, uh, thousands of studies, even the simple concept that we are talking about products that don't involve combustion, because that's the main difference, and you don't need to be an expert to understand. There is no doubt that we are having, we're talking about products of much lower risk. I cannot accurately quantify the level of risk reduction. There are some societies like the Public Health uh, England and the Royal College of Physicians who tried to uh, quantify it to the level of being 95% less harmful, for example, for electronic cigarettes, but that's not an accurate um, um, argument, but it gives you uh, at least 
the level of uh, risk reduction. And I think that's enough. And you know, I can give you a lot of uh, uh, examples of physicians giving advice to patients without having absolute certainty or even short-term evidence. For example, uh, we are always telling diabetics to avoid sugar and to use uh, sugar, um, uh, other, other sugar-like substances, like, for example, stevia or uh, aspartame or uh, other alternatives. We don't have long-term evidence that a diabetic is going to get uh, reduce um, his risk of developing complications or improve uh, his uh, survival and his prognosis by using these products. But it's a common sense argument for which we are giving advice all the time as physicians. Um, we are advising people to change their lifestyle in, ter in terms of uh, diet and exercise, but we don't prescribe exercise and diet. We don't prescribe three apples per day, morning, noon, and <laughs> afternoon, <laughs> you know. Um, we are giving advice which is not medically approved yeah. every day. We are doing things based on common sense without waiting for long-term evidence. And I think that with the current evidence that we have, at least for electronic cigarettes for 15 years, but also with the large uh, evidence that we have from, from other products, for snooze it's much more than 30 yeah. years. For heated tobacco products, it's a bit less, but there is growing evidence. And understanding what's the difference between burning organic material, combustion and non-combustion, I think it makes perfect sense to make suggestions to smoker, and it doesn't make sense at all, as I said, to implement similar restrictions or ban products which are by far less harmful compared to the most lethal nicotine nicotine product, which is yeah. the tobacco cigarette. Well, by, by promoting such approach, are we creating some sort of fa a false sense of security for consumers well, and perhaps even perhaps even undermine efforts to encourage complete abstinence from harmful uh, substances, behaviors. Um, these are legitimate ethical, uh, ethical of uh, course, considerations, of often, often uh, present among physicians and, and their and societies. And these are not new ethical considerations. These are the same arguments that were um, uh, used 30 or 40 years ago against harm reduction for intravenous drug users. Uh, that it will renormalize drug use, that it will prevent people from quitting, and so on. But eventually they were dropped as arguments. Now, concerning this, uh, you mentioned uh, promoting. Yeah. Uh, I would say that promotion needs to be regulated and not be promoted in a commercial aspect, but yeah. in a more regulated manner. And what, do you, what, what I mean by saying a promoted uh, marketing, uh, uh, regulated marketing yeah. and promotion, I mean that there is only one targeted population, and that is smokers, current and former smokers, adults, and rules and regulators and regulations should ensure that these products are promoted to this uh, population subgroup, and there is another form of regulation, how you're going to promote them. You are going to promote them, and I mentioned that before, as an additional option for those smokers who are, who are unable or unwilling to quit with the other currently approved products. Because as I said, these are not substitutes for the currently approved products, these are supplements to the currently approved products. So by creating a proper regulatory framework and by this simple approach, you know, your first line of choice yeah. is quitting by yourself or, your, or with medications, the second, third line choice how, is how, how to this product. This regulate, how to have a different regulation, but not to promote uh, new products, new innovative well, tobacco I'm products I to new consumers. I'm going to give you an example, how to e real examples. The EU, yeah. the current regulation, it's by far less restrictive than smoking. And there is a ban yeah. on the sales of these products to young people. End of story. The UK, the government and the public health authorities and scientists are actively promoting these products, even on TV. And they've been doing that for many years, and they have been extremely successful. After doing that, the smoking rates were declining, are declining at a very accelerated pace. They are now the second best example in Europe 12%. after, after uh, Sweden. Sweden was working on that with snooze, especially long time before the UK. 
and nothing bad has happened uh, with this kind of strategy, which has, which has been implemented for almost eight, nine years now. It's not mm -hmm. something new. And the second example I'm going to give you a way of promoting these uh, products appropriately and giving the right communication messages, because a ban means that there is no communication to the smoker, is the example of Greece. Now, what Greece has done, the health ministry created a scientific committee uh, which uh, was responsible for receiving files with scientific data from these products in order to determine if these products are associated with less risk or less exposure to toxic chemicals. Mm -hmm. It is a similar approach that was developed in the US by the FDA. So very recently, a few months ago, this committee, so basically the Greek government, approved a reduced exposure claim for two specific harm reduction products. These are heated tobacco cigarettes, yeah. not electronic cigarettes, because the companies themselves provided scientific data on the level of emissions, uh, toxic emissions, comparing tobacco cigarettes with electronic cigarettes. And uh, by creating this legislation initiative, I mean the creation of such a scientific committee, you are able now as a company to have a message in the package of a product that is not allowed to be sold to youngsters, yeah. Yeah? Uh, a package that is supposed to be sold to smokers, saying but that, the, look, the, this sorry, product... But the message is on the, on, the, on the package of the new product, not the old one. On not the product the, that was approved uh, by, the, by this committee. Okay. Uh, the committee is accepting files and information for any product that is willing to submit no, such, it's not, such it's a file. No, it's not the cigarette replace this product with, try to replace this product with the new well, one. Well, it's, it's not going to say try to replace okay. it, but it's going to say something like using this product will result That's in exposure to l fewer toxins than smoking tobacco cigarettes. This has also been implemented in the US. Uh, and um, they have for snooze, a reduced risk claim, so this product is associated with lower risk than snooze. And for uh, a heated tobacco product in the US, they have a reduced exposure claim. So this have already happened. They are very good examples of ways of communicating risks and difference in risk. Because, you know, it's not about talking about risk. Risk in general is present in all our activities. The level of risk, however, is very different. Driving a, a, a motorcycle without a helmet is very different risk with driving a motorcycle with a helmet. But still there is a risk driving a motorcycle with helmet. The same applies with all these products. We do suggest medications as a, as a first line option and psychological support and yeah. physician help. But in my opinion, even the physician, him or herself, when they see people who are smokers who are not willing to quit or who fail repeatedly with these products, there is no reason to delay. They need to provide them with an additional option because that's their role and that's only their role. An additional tool. And that's it. One more ethical consideration. Uh, as I see as a sort of public affairs professional, collaboration between science, policy makers, consumers, and industry is a crucial for any effective policy. Uh, it's crucial for a successful harm reduction strategy. Uh, you, obviously, here represent the science. And uh, um, how we can foster a meaningful, meaningful collaboration Why avoiding two things. One is conflict of interest. A second is uh, to maintain the scientific integrity. Conflict of interest will always be an issue, especially when we talk about the tobacco industry. Yeah. But I need to remind you that, for example, for electronic cigarettes, they were neither invented by the tobacco industry nor endorsed by the tobacco industry, at least for the first more than eight years. Um, in fact, uh, no one paid attention from the tobacco industry to electronic cigarettes, and only after 2012 or 2013 they entered the, um, the, the electronic cigarette market. Unfortunately, the tobacco industry has a very bad uh, history and, of course, a very bad reputation, rightly so. But today, we have the tools like replication. For example, me, myself, when I saw a study published about a heated tobacco product by the tobacco industry um, reporting levels of toxin emissions from these products compared to smoking, what we did in Greece is we uh, applied and we got some funding from the Mayo Clinic yeah. in the US and together with some American colleagues, we did 
a replication study in a Greek laboratory, and in reality, we fully replicated the results that, we that they, the industry reported. And this is something that can be used as a guard uh, against false publications, of course, and against manipulating data. And I think that if a company is clever enough, they would be extremely careful manipulating the data because today there are so many universities and so many research groups that can replicate such data that I think there will be in big trouble if they try yeah. to manipulate the data. In any case, yeah. replication is the epitome of science in any field. So it is one of the ways of um, um, uh, ensuring that any current knowledge is, um, is valid and, uh, or I even expanded. Replication has always been one of the main tools of science. You know, wh when you have some evidence, unless the evidence is replicated, you cannot uh, suppose that uh, it's true. And so that's what we're doing all these so years. So it's possible to keep scientific integrity? Yes, I when think... talking about tobacco. <laughs> I, 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 I think so, without, as I said, blindly okay. uh, trusting the industry. And I think that, you know, any, ca any sort of industry have their own conflicts in any field. Yeah. The tobacco industry has a very bad history, of course. But in any case, we should be openly debating and verifying any claims and any scientific evidence. I think that's the way moving forward. I'm not in favor of, uh, you know, banning voices and banning opinions or even scientific evidence, which is even more uh, absurd. I think that having an open deba debate, um, verifying data, uh, replicating data is the way to move forward. Le don't forget that whether we like it or not, there is no other way for governments to regulate other than asking companies in any field, including the tobacco, uh, to provide their data. Yeah. You know, you can't have the government funding data for, for products that are sold by private companies, whether it's tobacco products or anything else. They are obliged to ask for evidence by the companies themselves, even in the food industry, in the alcohol industry, pharma. this is happening, pharma everywhere. So. We need, of course, to be cautious. We need to replicate everything, and we need to ensure that everything is verified. But, you know, there are ways that it's nothing new. A basic principle in regulation for everything is risk-proportionate regulation. So, you evaluate the risk based on current knowledge, and you create regulations based on the risk proportionality principle. So the higher the risk, the more restrictive the regulations. The lower the risk, the less restrictive the regulations. And let's not forget that tobacco harm reduction products are not a simple consumer product. They are consumer products, of course, for specific subgroups of yeah. consumers, but with positive public health prospects because their only intended role is to act as competitors to tobacco cigarettes which means that they, we want them to be used as smoking substitutes. When you restrict the main today competitor, and that's the reality, the main competitor of, of tobacco cigarettes, which are harm reduction products, you are unintentionally, of course, but indirectly protecting the status quo. And the status quo is tobacco cigarette sales. And you know, uh, many companies like tobacco cigarette sales because they are very easy to be produced. They are not <laughs> really technology products. They are very cheap to be produced, and we don't want to protect the status quo. I think that harm reduction, mainly also because it's a technology product, represents an innovation. And I understand that many regulators and scientists uh, are afraid of innovations, but a careful assessment of the totality of evidence makes no doubt that the, these products are by far less harmful. Of course, we cannot be accurate in identifying the level of risk reduction. Let's, let's say that we know that it reduces the risk for cardiovascular disease by X percent. But we already even have scientific data from shorter term human studies that they do improve the prognosis. For example, a, a study three or four years ago for electronic cigarettes found that the, by substituting, uh, using electronic cigarettes as a substitute for smoking, the arterial function improves within four weeks, uh, despite using nicotine-containing electronic cigarettes. So there is 
a huge prospect. And you know, 8 million smokers die every year prematurely due to smoking-related disease. So we don't have 30 years to waste. We don't need 30 years of human evidence. And you know, when we apply restrictions or bans, we will never have 30 years of evidence because no one will be <laughs> left using it. We need to use current evidence, create flexible regulations, so be ready to change anything considering you know, the current knowledge and anything new that comes out. But I must say that since the regulation in Europe, it's seven years now, and since the products were released in, in Europe, which is 10, 12 years ago, we don't have anything bad coming out of these products, despite having them for several years, about six years, without any regulation at all, you know. So uh, I think that a more cautious but evidence-based approach will show the right pathway. There are examples of countries which have been more brave, let's yeah. say. The UK, as I said, Greece with what they developed in the Ministry of Health. Um, Sweden, of course, with what's happened for many years, uh, which show that the harm reduction approach can work. Sweden is not only smoke-free, but ha it has the lowest rates of lung cancer, cancer of the oral cavity, cancer in other organs, and cardiovascular deaths due to smoking than any other country in Europe. So we do have the examples of the outcome of uh, a harm reduction approach. Yeah. And I think that's what the country should and use. Finally, we are out of time, but one more question. You mentioned trust. And that's the one of the, the key topics of this conference. And uh, pandemic has brought the issue of trust, in, especially in yeah. both health experts and science, to the forefront. Of course, uh, as way I see it, trust is always a two-way street. And uh, it's crucial for health experts, and you are a, a cardiologist, and scientists as well, to engage with the concerns and perspectives of the public. Is it possible to have a better dialogue and mutual understanding between, let's say, ordinary people and you as scientists, scientific community? There, there is absolutely no, no doubt on that. I, I, I told and you how. That, well, uh, in 2014, yeah. when the EU initiated the dialogue of regulating electronic cigarettes, there was very limited understanding and very, very few researchers, I think I was one of the three or four researchers in Europe who were working on electronic cigarettes at that time. It was the consumers themselves who educated MEPs, who sent letters to the European Commission and who really created foundations in uh, preparing an appropriate regulation. The consumer needs are the number one topic. You know, we've seen that in harm reduction. When harm reduction was not accepted for drug users, it was the drug users and the HIV patients who were entering the meetings of the WHO and other organizations and were pressing them to give them solutions and to accept the harm reduction principle and approach. And the same can happen. We have a lot to learn by the users. You know, in the UK, vape shops who are mainly uh, created by users uh, are considered small smoking cessation services. They actively endorse vape shop uh, uh, owners to educate smokers into making a switch. This may sound uh, as some sort of a revolutionary approach. Yes, the UK has been at the forefront in this approach, but it has worked. It has worked, it's, it's been happening for eight years now. It's not something new. We can use their examples and we can add, of course, and make necessary changes based on the unique characteristics of each country. But there are ways of engaging all stakeholders, including the consumers, and the industry with a cautious approach, of course, as I said, the scientific community and the regulators, look at the totality of evidence without prejudice, and I'm sure this is going to be the perfect recipe to create an perfect regulation. Okay, I'm speeding things up because I'm moderating the, the another panel after this. So thank you uh, one more time for uh, joining thank us you. here. Big up, thank you. If you, have, you can have an applause for me, Dr. Farsalinas. Thank you. It very was much. a very interesting discussion and um, enjoy your stay here in Zagreb. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>